We begin tonight with that breaking news in Oakland, California, a warehouse party that turned into a deadly inferno. Witnesses say it went up like a tinderbox, burning in mere seconds. The scene so horrific, authorities at this hour are still searching for the missing. At least nine people killed, dozens unaccounted for, partygoers trapped on the second floor as the flames devoured that building. It was a gathering place where many artists lived and worked. Tonight, details about the victims are just beginning to emerge, and now questions about just how unsafe this building may have been. No sprinklers, the only stairway out blocked, and were there past building code violations? Our Neil Karlinski has been on the scene all day, and he starts us off tonight. It was 11.32 p.m. when the first calls came in. A party at this Oakland warehouse, an artist's collective was exploding into an inferno, flames ripping through windows. Firefighters could be seen breaking in with pickaxes. Bob Muley, one of the lucky few to make it out, tried to rescue a man calling out for help. I was pulling him out, he was a larger gentleman, and there was a lot of stuff in the way. The, fire, the, the flames were too much, was too much smoke, and I had to, I had to, I had to, I had to let him. I, I had to, you believe he's still in there right now, he never made it out? I haven't seen him, and there's been flames shooting out of the building for the past. 30 minutes, so oh, I, know I, 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 hope, I hope he's, I hope he's okay. By daybreak, the devastation was beyond what anyone expected. The entire roof collapsed. We did not have a, a lot of victims go to the hospital. It, it appears that people either made it out or they didn't make it out. Body bags marking some of the dead. Officials say nearly all of them appear to have been trapped on the second floor. There for a party featuring electronic music by an act called Golden Donna. Pictures from before the fire show a cluttered maze of art studios, mannequins, carpets, and furniture inside, a virtual tinderbox. Officials believe the victims became trapped on that second floor, engulfed within minutes. The only exit, a makeshift stairwell constructed with wooden pallets, quickly overtaken by flames, leaving no way out. Victims displaced by a deadly wildfire in eastern Tennessee this week are finally being allowed to return to their homes and businesses to assess the damage. The fire devastated the tourist community of Gatlinburg. At least 13 people were killed. This morning, anger is building towards local officials. Some say they waited too long to order an evacuation. DeMarco Morgan is in the town of Sevierville, just north of Gatlinburg. DeMarco, good morning. Good morning. Residents are continuing to deal with the reality of devastating images like this one, a home leveled by those raging wildfires as officials expect the death toll to rise. The lines were long and cars were backed up in traffic for hours as thousands of residents and business owners for the first time were allowed back into the small town of Gatlinburg. They were in a rush to check on their property after one of the state's worst wildfires left more than 1,000 homes and businesses destroyed and more than a dozen dead. Neil Razor was one of the lucky ones who found his family cabin intact. We were lucky. I don't know how that could happen with the devastation all the way around it. Terry Calhoun, husband and father of four, was not so fortunate. I, I came in, everything was burning. Calhoun and his family had just relocated from Lakeland, Florida, and had been living in the small one-room apartment for a year. This was the, our bed. The family had no other choice but to get out when wildfires took over their street. We found out late what was happening. The TV went down, the phones went down, and uh, when we went outside, everything over there was, everything around us was on fire. At a Friday news conference, Sevier County Mayor Larry Waters wouldn't say if the evacuation call should have been made sooner. We're not going to get into that right now because uh, we did the best they have and we're sorry for that, but we're not going to get into Monday morning quarterbacking right now. Severe flooding across a large part of southern Thailand has killed more than a dozen people after several days of heavy rain. At least one person was reported missing. Most of the victims are said to be fishermen. The Interior Ministry said six days of floods had affected over half a million people. The main rail link to the south has been cut. 
In Nakhonsi Thamarat, where at least five people died, high seawater levels have been made worse by flash floods from the mountains. A state of natural disaster has been reported in 11 provinces. The floods have struck just as Thailand enters the high season for tourism. On the island of Koh Samui, boats have been laid on to get visitors to the airport for scheduled flights. The recent heavy rainfall is extremely unusual for this time of year. The rainy season runs from June to October. More rain is expected in the region over the coming days. At least 54 people have been killed after a 6.5 magnitude quake struck off the coast of Sumatra in Indonesia. Buildings across the region have come crashing down, trapping dozens of locals underneath the rubble. It's become one of the most cursed areas in Southeast Asia, the tip of Sumatra, Aceh province. Another earthquake and again the region is reeling. It struck at 5am local time, many mosques collapsed. Here a multi-storey building tumbled into the street, crushing cars. The epicentre was only 20 kilometres off the northeastern coast of Sumatra at a depth of around 8 kilometres. It was felt hundreds of kilometres away, but the damage was largely contained to an area 100 kilometres from the epicentre. The Red Cross is still assessing how many have been affected. Many victims inside the collapse building and the ship and rescue teams still working in the location. Local TV showed dozens of injured people arriving at hospitals. The Red Cross says heavy machinery is now needed to save people trapped inside their homes. Twelve years ago, a 9.1 quake off Arche generated one of the deadliest tsunamis in history. 230,000 were killed. The town of Banda Arche was wiped off the map. No tsunami threat from this latest quake, but it still had people running from their homes the moment the shaking started. San Diego scientists estimates a, estimates a solar megastorm could erupt, could erupt and wreak havoc on Earth by the year 2020. In today's technologically dependent world, such an event could be catastrophic. It could cause major blackouts and disrupt daily life for some say up to 10 years. RT's Brigida Santos joins me tonight from Los Angeles for more on this. This is about the scariest news I've heard all week long, uh, outside of all the fake news that is supposed to be the truth. Regina, what are the odds of this happening? What are these scientists saying? These scientists say that there is a 12.5% chance that this could happen by the year 2020. Now, there are small solar eruptions that happen all the time, but a large one that could cause damage that we are talking about here happen very rarely. Now, this prediction comes from a team of scientists at the Predictive Science Center in San Diego, California. And what they did was they looked at historical patterns of the, this type of activity on the sun. Now, every 11 years, the sun goes through cycles of increasing and decreasing activity. Whenever it's in a period of increasing activity, it can happen where solar eruptions uh, happen on the sun and they send particles spewing into space and sometimes toward Earth. And while the occurrence of a catastrophic event is rare, it has happened in the past. And in fact, over 150 years ago in 1859, the largest ever recorded solar storm took place. And it is known as the, um, the Carrington event. And this was named after a British astronomer named Richard Carrington, who had observed a large solar flare spewing charged particles uh, into the Earth at about 4 million miles per hour. And from there, he was the first to determine that there was a link between solar activity and geomagnetic fields on Earth. These are political protests in Brazil that have been called by the same right-leaning activist groups that pressured for the removal of the leftist Workers' Party president Dilma Rousseff. But their leaders say that Rousseff was just one problem and that fighting corruption is an ongoing battle. They have been doing this for a long time in this country, but the people woke up and will no longer allow that these kind of things happen ever again. We are awake. Impeachment is over. 
but the Brazilian population will not fall asleep ever again. Brazil's corruption investigations, like the car wash probe into illegal dealings of national oil company Petrobras, have already brought down and even sent to jail several top politicians and business people. And some here believe the political establishment is trying to weaken the investigations with a recent vote of an anti-corruption bill by Congress, which some people here perceive as actually an attempt to limit the powers of judges and public prosecutors. In Athens, a peaceful march to mark the anniversary of a police-involved killing of a young teen turned violent. Hundreds of demonstrators are walking through the center of the city when officers say someone started throwing Molotov cocktails. Officials used tear gas in return. No one was hurt or arrested. The crowd was commemorating the eight-year anniversary of a teen's death. That police shooting in 2008 sparked days of protests. Now, people in Yemen have staged a mass rally to voice their support for the newly formed National Salvation Government. The demonstrators also slammed Saudi Arabia's air raids on Yemen. They shouted slogans against the al-Saud regime as well as Israel. The Salvation Government is led by former governor of Aden, Abdelaziz bin Habtur. It is tasked with running Yemen's internal affairs and dealing with Saudi Arabia's aggression against the impoverished nation. Over 11,400 Yemenis have been killed since the Saudi war began in March 2015. Hundreds of people arrive on a daily basis to this camp to become the latest internally displaced people fleeing the fighting in the Iraqi city of Mosul. Hassan Shah camp was erected in anticipation of the hundreds of thousands expected to escape the fighting. However, the camp lacked health services until now. We opened the clinic to serve the 52,000 people in Hassan Shah and Khazir camps. There will be doctors specializing in children, women, and general health available every day for the refugees uses free of charge and these includes medicine. This clinic is expected to serve a total of 9,000 families and it was set up to deal with the basic health needs and was a step to improve the lives of the refugees. But it's still not enough for the people here. We are grateful to be here and alive. The camp provides services like fuel for heating and water but we have shortages. We run out every few days. We hope the world can help us during this hardship. We have shortages on everything, but especially water and even bread. We have to fight and beg to get bread in the morning. We need better organization so everyone receives aid. Many of us here have fled with nothing and have no money. We can't buy the things we desperately need. They arrive in their thousands, desperate for a drink of water. Fighting in Mosul between Iraqi forces and ISIL has left 40% of the city without water. That's 650,000 people, according to the UN. Anger over the shortage is building. Are we not Iraqis? This is the land of the Mesopotamia rivers. Why we don't have water? This is eastern Mosul. Even here, in areas retaken by Iraqi forces, there's no water or gas. Without basic services, those that fled cannot return to this area, which is cleared of ISIL fighters. Desperation has forced some to use sewage water. For 10 days, we haven't had a single drop of water. We've used water from the sewage tanks with mud inside it. Without access to running water, the places that have been cleared of ISIL fighters remain uninhabitable. Now that's an issue because the people that are fleeing through this checkpoint can't get spaces in the camps because the camps are overflowing. And it also means the people that are living in the camps who want to go back to those areas that have been cleared cannot because they remain completely destroyed. This is Basin's most important job these days. He collects small pieces of wood to burn at night to stay warm. His family would use it to cook, but they have no food in the house they're living in. We are foreigners here in Al Zabdiya neighborhood. Everything is new here. I miss my home. The bombardment on my street turned everything to dust. First we went to Mayesser neighborhood. The bombs followed us. We are waiting for some food now. People offered to give us some. 
أكثر شيء بخاف من البراميل والقزائر. They are among the thousands of people who moved from the areas of Aleppo which are now under Syrian government control. لا أكل لا شرب. There is no food, my brother. Nothing. No food. No water for children. We came here with our basic belongings. We were forced out by government attacks on our neighborhood. The mangled remains of a vehicle is the view from their balcony. UNICEF says nearly half a million children live in besieged areas across Syria and 100,000 of them are stuck in eastern Aleppo. When there are no air strikes, people say there's the buzz of drones overhead. And then there are the barrel bombs which continue to fall over Aleppo. But even under these conditions, Basil's family doesn't want to move to government-held areas. I don't want to go to regime areas even though my children are hungry and there's no food. I'm afraid for my children. Los Angeles authorities are asking residents to remain calm but vigilant about a threat against a city subway station. The FBI says a warning about a potential bombing of the Universal City Station came in on an international tip line, leading officials to increase security across the entire Los Angeles County transit system. Ahead of a NATO foreign minister's meeting in Brussels, the alliance's secretary general, Jens Stoltenberg, held a press conference, which, as usual, was dominated by anti-Russia rhetoric. He says Moscow is supporting anti-government forces in eastern Ukraine in breach of the 2014 Minsk peace agreement. The security situation in eastern Ukraine remains extremely serious. The ceasefire is being violated every day sometimes hundreds of times, with explosions from equipment banned under the Minsk agreements. Moscow has insisted on many occasions that it does not have a military presence inside Ukraine. NATO also accuses Russia of playing a very negative role in Syria. Analysts say the West is taking this stance because Moscow supports the country's president Bashar al-Assad. But in fact many security experts say Russia, Iran and President al-Assad's forces have done much more in Syria to defeat terrorist groups, including Daesh, than the West has. Donald Trump has indicated he will improve relations with Russia once in office. Many are welcoming this position. This is Ahem, near the Saudi border. All the living have fled. Along roads where death can descend at any time. Past a bombed out hospital. Judah Jabber is four months old. And she has been fighting to survive since the day she was born. 10,000 children have died from preventable diseases. Half a million, like Judah, are severely malnourished. Before the war, Yemen imported 90% of staple food but the supply chain is broken now. God will punish the bombers, this man says. The bridge was hit just two weeks ago. Civilians and food trucks use the same roads as soldiers. In the rural areas, they're farthest from aid, waiting for the world. The toll on the nation's sprawling forest is readily apparent, though the culprit is not always visible. Invasive insects like the southern pine beetle and the emerald ash borer are attacking trees from the northeast to California to Florida. One study found almost two-thirds of U.S. woodlands will be at risk by 2027, causing a multi-billion dollar problem. This should be a dark green uh, canopy, and this should be very shaded underneath. And so the fact we can see so much gray and brown from the twigs, it's striking. The Inca Chaca Reservoir, which serves La Paz, has been reduced to less than 10% of its capacity. The mountains that surround it should, at this time of the year, be covered with snow. The rain, when it comes, is not enough to alleviate the worst drought anyone here can remember. Marta has had to close her restaurant. There's no water. We've been waiting, asking those who have water to give us some. 
and for the authorities to come because we really need it. Emergency measures are in place to get water to those in need, but it's sometimes not enough, and many are forced to find it where they can. It's chaos. Without water, we can't do anything. So we've come here to use this stream to wash our clothes. Rationing means many have running water for only a couple of hours a day, or none at all. We tend to take for granted something as fundamental to our daily lives as water, until it runs dry. Many Bolivians are now discovering that every drop counts for washing and cleaning, for cooking and drinking, for recreation and industry, and even for flushing the toilet.